we had a mic, but the mic doesn't really work. So if you want to use this time to actually maybe move up a little bit closer, that would that might be helpful. I'll try to you know belt it out, but you know. And there are some there are a couple seats up here too. There there's one right there, and there's a chair up here as well. So I'll try to belt, but just want to give you the option. So as Ju Judy said, my name is Esteban Gonzalez. Um, I've been working in the digital and traditional advertising and marketing business for, for quite some time. Um, I'm actually, I still consider myself fellow, fairly new to Chicago. I've only been here six years. Most of the time I lived on the East Coast uh, and lived and worked in Boston and New York. Um, I come from the area of, I guess, an agency life of strategy. And uh, the best way to think about me and what I do is I'm an account planner. So if you guys work with people like that, you kind of know where my head is when, when I start to think about certain things like that. And if you, if you don't know what an account planner is, they're basically strategists around consumers and what consumers think about and what consumers care about and what are their motivations, what do they hope to get, you know, things from brands and uh, all those kind of things. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, empathy-based personas, which are, you know, you all have heard a lot about personas, but I have a particularly unique way of approaching them. As I said, uh, I've, I've been here in here in Chicago for about six years. I started a firm here at my own company. It's called Brand Therapy. And basically what we do is we do insights around consumers and we work with companies to try to develop creative ideas for reaching them and for developing a relationship with them. So. Customers are king, right? Everybody knows this. We all have heard it for many, many years. Um, every organization seems to have this as something that they tell themselves. Um, this is an old cover from, I think it's 2007, of Time Magazine, when it was all of a sudden really apparent to everybody that people have the power. And as a result, companies needed to start paying attention to their customers in a little bit better, better way. And companies spend tons of money to get information about what their consumers really care about and what they do and how they behave. Um, this is an example of, I don't know if you've ever seen any reports from companies like Iconoculture or other research organizations, but they spend a lot of money finding out a lot of facts about how we all behave. But it's weird because even though they do that, I myself feel this way and it seems like this when I deal with many clients, no matter big and small, it's like this is the way they wind up thinking about their consumers. They're these amorphous people that are mostly spoken about in generalizations. Um, and you know, to kind of get over that, companies have developed this idea of personas and personas have been around for quite a while. Um, I actually, I started, I, I became exposed to personas first when I was working at Organic in New York which is a digital agency, um, which became actually very famous for, uh, for the persona methodology that we wound up developing there and actually were written up for many, many years with Forrester Research as kind of like the gold standard of developing personas. Um, they, they're really, they're, they're things that companies use to begin to, to kind of add shape to some of this data. And, and the problem is though, is that things have shifted a little bit over the last couple of years. I mean, now more and more companies are looking to their data and looking to data analytics and business scientists and things like that for information about um, who the cu their customers are, which you know it, it seems to seems to be that the community's somewhat fallen in love with this idea. And this is an article so much so that they even are saying things like this: that that thinking about human judgment and the human connection may not necessarily be something that's really valuable for companies as they kind of move forward. Now, I don't know necessarily if this is completely the, the right way to kind of think, and actually it kind of is a little bit disturbing to me because I, after all, am a strategist about the way people behave. And when we're talking about the way people behave and when we're trying to do stuff that actually talks about marketing and getting people to behave in a certain way, we're, we're really interested in relationships, in particular this relationship. So somebody saying that human judgment isn't necessarily as important a thing is kind of a little bit of a challenge. And I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen this in, in your work, if you work in the marketing field and in, in the development field as well. Um, it makes me kind of step back and think about you know, some kind of key ideas that have helped inform the way I 
kind of shape and do marketing with my clients. Um, and one of, the, one of the big ideas is Einstein's idea that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. And really what we've kind of turned that into is this way of thinking about it that, you know, not all information is insight, that there's something different there that we want to try to capture. And so um, when we think back again about personas, we, taking this idea, we've begun to think that personas are a little bit more than just trying to develop a profile of who it is that you're trying to reach. They're a little bit more than, than just having, being able to call about a John or a Joe or something and being able to kind of point to the specific characteristics that define them. Um, as a matter of fact, what we found is that personas, particularly in this environment with so much complexity and so much information out there, that they take on a new kind of significance. Now, why, you may ask, you know, why, how can they actually do this? Um, well, the secret, at least from my point of view, and, and what seems to be gaining a little bit of traction, and I hope what attracted you to kind of come to uh, talk about this, is really this idea of empathy. We think that empathy really kind of changes the equation. And we found that you know, when you're thinking about data and you're thinking about you know, the research that goes into doing creative work, that, that empathy adds a level of context that not all information can actually do. At the same time, what it allows us to do is it allows us to push beyond just describing things in general terms. So we're not really interested in defining what the big buckets really are. What we're really interested in doing is making a greater connection with the specifics that we can actually hook into and understand as humans. So instead of just doing the norm about describing, what we're actually do, trying to do is identify individuals that can help us understand what it is that we need to, to do. So the other effect of this is that by calling on empathy and by doing this process that I'm going to share with you a little bit further, um, we have a lot of different impacts on the other things that we all work with that we don't really necessarily take into account, but how we function as teams, how we function as, you know, whether or not we're able to work collaboratively with each other. Um, and less like silos. The empathy, working with empathy allows you to break out of that. But I think the most important thing that I've seen is this last one. It's like it becomes less about making a solution for a description and more about making a solution for something that we feel a part of that problem. So, I'll tell you a little bit about our approach to personas. So, we, we start with the same kind of, from the same point that just about everybody starts, with information. The key thing there is that we're not trying to, so don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about, you know, ignoring data and ignoring the research. What we're actually talking about is establishing a different relationship with the information that we get from the client or from doing our own research or, or whatever. And so that we can start with things like this. Like, I don't know how many of you recognize this. But this is, and it's kind of tiny, but it's, uh, it's Simmons data about how people are behaving. And we actually did this for a project for Motorola. Tons of information about how people interact digitally and how people interact with their devices and such. Or, or we can start with data like this, which is, I, I don't know if you've, you're familiar with this as well, but there's a lot of, there are a lot of new tools out there to look at social data, to begin to understand what people are saying, and you are actually able to, to see it in first person, you know, people's tweets, people's Facebook posts, people's reviews and things like that, and, and analyze this, this information. So we can start with things like that, but when we get together as a team and we sit down for the creative proposition, which is different than just describing, it can be more like we're getting to know these guys who, I'm sorry, these guys who are runners, who one of, one of our clients is uh, CARA, which is the Chicago Area Runners Association. Um, it, we can get to know them, or even these guys who are business people who, when you look at, don't look necessarily that interesting, but the interesting thing is that when you talk about empathy, you can actually have a different relationship when you're thinking about B2B problems than you normally would. So the key really is how we process all the bits of information that we bring into the equation to develop these particular kind of personas. So we start, this is an example I'm pulling from uh, experience working with Kara. 
And for what we did for CARA was uh, we developed a new brand strategy for them and a, a strategy around how their website should engage their membership. Um, CARA, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, CARA is the largest runners association in the Midwest. It's got like 9,000 members. It's pretty huge. And it's, a, it's, you know, if you do any kind of running thing, they're usually there. But we start with the information that we can gather from the client and that they know about the, uh, the domain and the discipline. All of this kind of information that, you know, we're used to under, you know, understanding as we process what we do, their age, their income, where they live, things like that. The key thing is, is that what we're doing is we're looking for patterns in the data that we can begin to kind of get a hold of. The patterns that we're looking for are very specific. There are things that can help us go from just describing the things that we can measure to the things that activate us as individuals in our daily life, as people. So instead of just talking about demographics and web transactions and things like this that we all get when we're, you know, when we're asked to develop or cons con you know, do concepting on a particular problem, we're looking for the emotional drivers. We're looking for the things behind preferences. We're looking for things like that, that these people connect to. Now, if we're really lucky, and this is one of the things that I think I've been very fortunate with the clients that I deal with, is that clients understand that it takes a little bit more. They've been at it for a while. They've seen how things always fall short and flat when you try to follow a formula. And what we're able to do is we try to get out and we try to do these things um, with our clients. They're called empathy exercises. And basically, it's kind of walking experiences where they get to walk in the shoes of, of their customers. And this is, that's actually no pun intended, but it is a pun because this was work we did for uh, New Balance, for a pitch for New Balance with an agent, agency here called Kramer Krasko. Um, we went and visited college students that were runners and kind of tried to understand what was important to them. Uh, this is another project I did was for the National Association of Realtors and one of the things that we were able to do during the process was go to their mid-year conference so we could see what realtors care about and what, how they interact at their national conference. What, what do they care about? How do they behave? How do they move around each other? Um, we can also do different kinds of ethnographic things that are a little bit more documented but they can also be done in a guerrilla way. So this is uh, for bear diabetes care. We wanted to see how people carried the devices that they use and their little kits to, to deal with their insulin injections and things like that. So we looked inside what people carry around with them. And we even, if we're lucky, we, ha we, we do primary research where we'll actually have focus groups. But you can do interesting things so that we're not interested in just you know, the, what somebody says about things. This was for a credit monitoring service. I don't know if you can, can, can see it that well, but we asked them to draw movie posters about what they felt their life would be like if it was a movie with their credit. And it opens up a lot of doors for thinking about how these people are really behaving, that we don't see them in this very narrow bandwidth of how they interact with our brand or our product or the behavior we're trying to to get at. We see them in a much, much broader sense. So the, what we do with that information is we begin to develop a model for a persona. Uh, these models are things that are going to be in common across all potential possible personas. And what they're really about is they're, they're about this idea of trying to derail the normal data think that we tend to get in, and that there's a lot of pushback from organizations and that you know, we'll have all those quantitative kind of things. But what, we, what we're able to do is we're able to kind of create this, this other tool that we can use to kind of get off that track. Um, this is an example of a persona model. And I'll just read a few of them because I think they're interesting. So um, uh, I, when I think of volunteering, it's more about a responsibility to give back on one side or a personal choice to give back. Uh, when I walk to work, uh, when I walk to work or one of my favorite places, I stick to the way I know or I try a new way every time. These are not the kind of things that you're going to find in research typically, but they're the kind of things that we can act on and we can get that activate us as people who are creating or designing things for people. So, with that, then we'll develop a skeleton of a particular persona. And this is how we start. This is how the process basically starts with skeletons like this. Skeletons have uh, demographic information. 
tells us the stuff that we learned in research. It has a story that we imagine. It's very short. It's not a lot of detail on it. Um, and then what we do is with these dimensions, we're able to plot our different possible personas on this way. And we create a number of skeletons that we then work with. And the idea there is, if we can create things that fit into those generalized buckets enough so that we can have comfort with that we're actually paying attention to the data, we can also let ourselves begin to kind of identify with these people as people and kind of work to kind of flesh them out. And I think this is the important part about the way we go about and why the skeletons are so important to the process. They are done specifically to provoke people. Now, I don't, I don't know necessarily if in your job or your, your functions you get a chance to do that, but it's something that I think is a really important part of most kind of creative endeavor. And it's nice to have the tools that actually are, enable you to do this. And the way they provoke is they kind of, first of all, they, they break people's guard down because they're very much embedded into the, in the data. They trigger a personal connection with people so that they begin to recognize. I mean, one of the best things is when you can sit and a, a client says, oh yeah, that's Joe, my neighbor. He's, I know him, he's like, you know, and that's all they need to say because they identify with that individual. Um, they bring out emotional details that are gonna make your persona much richer than just kind of a generalized profile. Um, they surface attitudes and experience and, and are different kinds of attitudes and different kinds of motivations and things like that. And they actually, they create this idea of potentially conflict and different kinds of opinions about what's really important and what's really not. What we do with these, these skeletons is we take them into a workshop and we brainstorm on certain different kinds of dimensions uh, about each of these individuals. And one of the key things that is very important is the workshops aren't just open to everybody who's on the project or whoever one that the client really you know wants to bring into it. Um, workshops are really kind of very interesting events. And as a result, we work really closely with the client to make sure we pick the right right people to do the, to do this. Because this it doesn't take, it doesn't, not everyone has the skills to kind of stop being very literal and start being a little bit more imaginative and to switch back and forth between the data says this, but I kind of know that. And so what we're, we usually look for as we try to build these is we look for a mix of people who have that kind of imagination. We look for people who have a lot of experience in the particular field, so who have spent a lot of time with the consumers or the different constituents that we're working with. And for people who have a certain kind of like stature that are respected for what they do, because their word winds up, when they participate in this, winds up helping build consensus throughout the organization as we move through the process. So the thing that's really interesting is that empathy, we all recognize empathy because we experience it every day. But what turns it really magic is when it happens in a group focused on a, sing on a singular thing together. So as I said, when we get together and we bra brainstorm, we brainstorm on attributes like this. Um, what we do is we put ourselves in the place of this skeleton and we answer these questions from their point of view. So a lot of interesting things happen. First of all, your SVP who supposedly knows X, Y, and Z is really no different than the person who's like the cashier and deals with this person, this customer, all the time. And this person who is in a different area, all of a sudden may become an expert on something that senior management may or may not even know. A really good example of this is um, one, of the, one of the early projects I, I did personas for was for Carter's Kids Wear. And typically on a team, you know, you have the designers, you have maybe have a, a front-end developers involved in it, you have strategists, you have client side. Well, our systems engineer, our systems engineer is a father of four kids. And so, you know, in, in digital agency, he's probably the only one who actually understands what it's like to shop for kids all the time. So it was a really amazing thing to be able to bring him in and to have him offer insights and ideas and opinions with the CFO, with the CMO of Carter's, Carter's Kidswear. So that kind of brainstorming, it, it allows us to bring a lot of things to the table, but yet it's a certain amount of leveling of the field. 
what we ultimately do after we have a workshop is it's fleshed out. It looks somewhat like this, which, sorry, the projector isn't that great, but it's basically a, a much more fleshed out version of who this person is, addressing from a first person point of view of all of those kinds of things that we've brainstormed as a, as a group, brainstormed on as a group. Um, one of the last things that we do is we give the, the persona a face and a name and a mantra. And I actually, this wasn't for one that I, I actually did, but I liked it. I thought you guys, from what I understand, you're working with creative fields, you deal with this. This was a girl who was entrepreneurial and at the Comic Con created her own comic and sold it for three three dollars. And I think just if you can imagine that kind of person, then you're experiencing the empathy that I'm talking about when you're looking at her picture. It affected me like that. But the indeliverables wind up looking somewhat like this. This is a persona that we created for uh, Kara. This is Brenda. She's a seasoned runner. She is basically uh, pretty intense about it. Um, we have her story there. We talk a little bit about the different ways that things that she thinks of the brands. Talk about some of those personal things that, that we brainstorm <coughs> that, that are told from either a first person point of view or a way that she would answer them. And uh, we have the dimensions back up there which allow us to have a little bit of context with the other ones that will develop along this line. This is another example of persona. And I mentioned the National Association of Realtors. Um, the interesting thing about, about that project is that, um, and, and, and it kind of brings the idea of empathy and how empathy can let loose and make things happen within an organization. The National Association of Realtors is the largest trade group organization in the United States, if not the world. I think there are like 1.4 million realtors that are a part of this group. Um, they do research every year, and every year it says the same thing. Their realtor, their member, is a 54-year-old woman who lives somewhere in near in a suburban area who sells so much and has a kid in college and does this, that, and the other. Everyone in that organization knew that that necessarily isn't true, that that, and that does very little for activating them to do the kind of things that they do to develop programs, to develop websites, develop all kinds of different things um, for their membership. So through our process, we were able to identify two groups that everyone kind of knew that they need to, needed to pay attention to, but that they never had the artifact. They never really had the document that they could look at and say like, yes, that makes sense. Uh, and that they all felt that that was true. The two that, that we created were first Anthony, who's like this young up and comer guy who's like watching you know, cable TV, seeing about the person who's flipping $3 million apartments in Miami, and he wants to be a star. And they never had found a way to address that individual. Also, another thing that was very interesting is that this is the prime person who's going to be using their website as a resource. So when they're redesigning re realtor.org, you know, it, it, it just seemed to make sense that they should have their eyes set on someone who's a little bit different. A second one that we also identified that they hadn't really talked about was um, a bro broker owner of a small kind of firm, less than 10 people, who was actually kind of straddling the, the, straddling the line between being a realtor and, and really needing like small business, you know, SBA help in terms of managing and growing a small business. And they had, you know, they have a large membership that are around this kind of these these kind of people, but they had never been able to actually find a way to kind of identify this. Um, so this is another example of what the final deliverable looks like. Uh, these are great from from that point of view. Clients love them, and they wind up having a lot of traction and getting a lot of play in the organization because they bring together a lot of the things that people know and that people can identify with. And they actually help do bring that empathy even to the individuals who aren't, weren't participants in the workshops. But the real value, though, is really much more along that line. The artifacts are great, but the real value that comes from doing this process and doing things this way is kind of much, much bigger. Um, one of the first things is, is that now we have, when I say we, I say collectively with the client, we have a focus group of four individuals that we can channel, we know them, we know what's important to them, we know what they care about, and we can channel them when we respond to different questions. 
So these were for the, the four personas that we developed for Kara. And uh, also, again, kind of bringing up audiences that Kara had, had really not considered as important. Um, this last one, Beverly, was, is a casual runner. runner. She's kind of, she runs for fitness. She probably runs just a little bit. Well, Kara's supposed to be for all runners in Chicago, but predominantly it was focused for people who were doing a half marathon or a marathon, and that's pretty much it. So the organization was able to first to, to, to identify a, a group that they supposedly, the brand was supposedly serving, but really wasn't. But we were able then, with this focus group, to ask certain questions that were of incredible strategic importance to the organization. So they had considered at the time whether they were going to buy races and own races. So we put that in front of the personas, and it facilitated the board being able to think about this from a different point of view rather than personal agendas or I think we should do this or my friend who was on another board said that or things like that and make decisions in a completely different way. At the same time, since we can do this, we're, we, we can begin to develop customer journeys. And I don't know how uh, if you deal with this kind of stuff, but it's basically describing the relationship and how the, the relationship grows over time with your, with your customers. But we can begin to put some feeling underneath that and, and write things about what, what the journey looks like from the first person of the customer. Not, you know, we, we send them advertising, we get the direct response from them, we push them in the funnel this way, and we do that. It's more from their point of view. I have this kind of need, and it's solved by this. I thought this and had this kind of perception, and it carried me to the next level with my relationship with the, with the organization. Um, it can inspire us, and actually all of this serves as the basis for strategies around the experiences we develop. So doing things like for the National Association of Realtor, their realtor.org, for SEMA, I don't know how many of you are members of the Chicago Interactive Marketing Association. Um, we did, they were a client, we actually did this pro process with them uh, as well, so trying to figure that out. For the Chicago Yacht Club, what kind of experiences are going to be compelling to their membership and at the same time begin to push a different image of their brand out there that is not elite and kind of uh, hoity-toity, but is something that is a part of the, the Chicago community and wants to be a greater part of it, things like that. So all of these, this kind of work that we do can feed into developing strategies around the experiences we develop. And I actually just, some of you may be working on app development. We just went through this process to develop the experience behind an app uh, for a startup in Boston. It's very, very, very useful because it helps us figure out which features are important, which features aren't important, and actually puts us in an entirely different frame of mind from what is it that we want to show to what is it that they really need and that we can deliver the value. Another way that this process really helps is, so now you have these fake individuals that you have this empathy for. And people do research all the time when we go, you do creative, you do testing, you do all kinds of stuff. Um, now we actually have something where we can validate the work we do via impaneling groups of people that reflect the empathetic relationship that we have with the personas. So we impaneled a whole group of, I forget the name of the woman who was doing this, who worked for Monster.com and who was, uh, we were going, actually we were, um, one, of the people, one of the groups that, we, that Monster goes after is recruiting. Uh, recruiting companies and small kind of businesses that are looking for people. So we, we impaneled this particular group based on that persona and then we figured out what would be appropriate. We were able to put the, the concepts that we created and we were able to find such tight alignment. We did the same thing on the National Association of Realtors as well to test the different ideas and to, ref excuse me, to refine the personas a little bit further. Um, all this kind of stuff is possible when you think about the process in a more fungible way and you think about the process with this idea of empathy needing to be baked into it, both in terms of the deliverables, in terms of the process, and in terms of the things that you wind up using this for to develop. So these four points are kind of the summary of what I had mentioned a little bit earlier, but really it's the idea about absorb data and looking for patterns to make the research user friendly. So we don't all understand spreadsheets and Simmons data and you know queries of social data. So let's try to make it something that we understand as people. Um, and then starting with stories that ring true, I think that's very important. We all connect with stories. It's, I think, in, in our DNA. 
Uh, and then the other thing is, is to think of your team as people that you want to collaborate with, to conspire, and you want to provoke them to kind of go beyond the normal ways of thinking and create new, new kind of solutions for problems that we may have thought we, we all understood. Um, I found this, this quote. This is from a guy named Bill Drayton. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ashoka. But Ashoka is a really cool organization that does social innovation and kind of social entrepreneurship and funds things all over the world. And I think he's, he's right. And, that, and it's really funny is the more I interact with clients these days and the more we talk about big data and the more we talk about, okay, well, how's it going to be, re how's research going to validate it, how things are going to go on, the more I'm finding that there is a need for this kind of framework or way to balance all this stuff in a, in a, in a sense that actually propels us to make stuff. Not just propels us to describe what's out there, but to actually propels us to make stuff. So with personas, you know, I'm focusing on this kind of deliverable, and, and not necessarily even this kind of deliverable, but strategies that are focused on the consumer. Empathy brings these kind of benefits. You know, you, you have a much more authentic view of who your customer is. You have something that you can connect to. Um, you have an idea, better ideas about how to be meaningful for these people. At the same time, we can do great things together when we bring this empathy to the fore forefront. So people actually collaborate. It's very interesting to be in a situation where, and I'll give you another example for the, um, the National Association of Realtors. That organization has 35 standing committees, there's 35 departments. The committee that oversees communications is like 125 people around the country, okay? Those people never interact, they never talk, and they never like agree on things. It's just not the kind of, it's not set up that way. They were able, we were able to bring people in, the right people in, to a larger group, and they all wound up agreeing about these personas. So you can have this kind of collaboration, and you can have this kind of um, infectiousness with when people get excited about who you're talking about um, through this process. This is, actually this is the NAR. One interesting thing, we did the personas for the website and challenge their assumptions about who the main, their audiences were. A year later, we found out, and we weren't actually involved in this, but a year later, a um, client called and said, you know, we've decided to blow up those personas, and they are actually making life-size versions of these things and putting them on a stage at our national leadership, com leadership uh, conference so, and saying, these are the audiences that we need to meet from now on. So it's kind of interesting that these would get traction all their own within an organization. I mean, I think that's actually kind of a unique thing. So I also found this quote from a guy named Peter Merholtz, who, who, you know, if you work in UX, you probably are aware of him and, uh, you know, his company. Um, but basically affirming the idea that personas, not only because what they do is they capture the empathy that, that people have within the organization, they're a way to actually surface it and almost conjure it up when you bring them into the business kind of meetings in a business setting for various program development kind of things. So with empathy, the relationship becomes a little bit more two-way. It's not so much we're describing and we know everything. It becomes a little bit more kind of communicative. At the same time, I think one of the things that I found is that working with empathy makes the whole design process, the whole creative process, more of a conversation. So believe it or not, your, your audiences, your customers can actually collaborate with you on solving the problems that you want to solve and create value for them. At the same time, they can be really provocative to begin to take chances, to take risks. I mean, I, I come from the account planning group, and the wisest people that I've known, you know, at the chief creative officer level, at the, you know, whatever level, have, have all said the same thing. Risk early. And you can risk early with personas. You can, make, you can make bold gestures, doing things in strategy and with planning early, as opposed to trying to do it in the creative end when things are almost too baked to actually be back out of if you need to. And I think the best thing is is that it kind of removes a little bit of the uh, adversarial nature from the way I think companies and even internal organizations operate. And instead, if, you're, if it's all about getting to know a person, what it winds up being 
it's, it winds up being something that you're excited about, that you're not solving a problem necessarily for yourself, but you're creating opportunities. Change is the game. Talk too long, but uh, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions or comments? Sure, I do. I, uh, I get the concept of the person's persona. What are you talking about? The brand has a persona too. I'm sorry. Correct? The brand has a persona yes, too. It does. So how does this play into that? And is it necessarily a mirror? Well, um, it depends. I mean. I think that when people talk about the brand having a persona, it's actually the way the brand is expressed. So what we tend to do is, by focusing on the audience, we're discovering the needs that are there. And then we can find a similar way to describe the way that the brand s solves those needs, or kind of meets those needs, either in the expression, the design, or the kind of, sometimes it's the programs, products that a, that a brand offers. But uh, it's kind of a different proposition. I, mean, I don't know if that's answering your question or. It's another, it's just another Chris <laughs> presentation, yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes? So I really like the concept that you had of the models, um, like those questions with the sliders. Yeah. Um, but I was just wondering where you came up with those questions. Like, how do you usually walk to work? It's not well, that's, that's part of where like the intuition and the kind of creativity comes in. You'll read a lot of different data and you'll see a lot of different things and then you'll make assumptions. So the ones that we talked about were like basically about how they make judgments. So if, you're, if your audience, if your product is very, very kind of rigid and conservative and whatever and you are saying and all your data says your customers are rigid, conservative or whatever, then you can kind of create a dimension where something's very rigid to something's marginally rigid. And you use some something that'll allow you to figure out who this person is. Say if it's uh, for a, say a consumer, consumer product for like uh, a mom, you know. You might come up with something that describes an aspect of that life that, that identifies that, that point, that kind of dimension with real concrete things to look. So like, uh, I always have dinner ready at five. I kind of, you know, come on, I've got teens. Who knows when dinner is going to happen, right? And, and, and the thing is there is you're talking about something very concrete, which is decision style, but what you're doing is you're using examples that we all recognize from our own life. So it kind of says the same thing, but it says it in a more interesting way. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? I'm so, okay. I'm sorry, I can't. What are some of the situations you put the personas in to measure how they react to those things? Um. Well, a lot of different kinds of position or um, questions that you can ask them. Um. For instance, uh, prioritizing features and functionality for a particular website. Uh, the Chicago Yacht Club, when we started the project, so that was another example of working with a nonprofit board, lots of different people. You know, things get created by committee uh, in a nonprofit. It's sometimes even wackier than when they're committed, created by committee in an organization. But we started with a list of about 150 features that everybody wanted on the website. And everybody was adamant. There's not a single feature in that list when we first started the project that anybody would have given up on at all. But what we did is after we did the personas and we went through the process of then saying, okay, let's have a meeting about the features and let's go through and let's say, what's a nice to have, a must have, or a not at all for these people. What happened all of a sudden is that thing got whittled down to like 40 instantly. So we asked them different kind of features that would be valuable to them. Uh, another example is we do it with creative. So if we're thinking what's more important in terms of the benefits of a particular product. Is it, is it fast and sleek? Or is it really about uh, precision and performance? You know? And we ask the personas, what does, that, what does that mean to you? What's really going to affect you? And that helps us write a creative brief for the creative team that says, okay, we want to focus more on performance and, and whatever. Uh, another example, uh, some really good examples of actual, they're not marketing questions, 
they're actual business questions, which is another thing that's becoming very, very intriguing for me because we start out in marketing communications in a brand space and all of a sudden I'm actually doing kind of strategic consulting for these companies. But Kara wanted to know whether they should invest in buying races. And there were a lot of people who said races are money makers and they get us on the on the map and we can force people to become members because they you know they'll get a discount. When we went through the exercise with the personas, <coughs> it became clear that that was not going to make them very happy at all. You know, uh, another thing would be, what is the website really all about? What does the website need to be? And we did that, went through that exercise with Kara as well, and that changed the whole idea that it was supposed that it's it's a basically a member resource uh, focused <coughs> on advocacy and sharing uh, and wellness, as opposed to just promoting races. So. Do you think that you have to effectively be outside of the organization to do this? Because if you're internal, there's so much politics and too close to the topic to really have a clear clarity to it. You know, that's a, that's a really good question because I, I actually don't think it's something that you need to be external. I think what the value of having someone external, like what we, the reason the clients love like what we do, is that we take that burden off of somebody who's got a career in an organization, who has to have political alliances, right, who's right. you know working about. So we take that off. But one thing that's really been nice, and you know the NAR is a really good example uh, of it, as well as all of these other organizations, is by doing it as a facilitator. We then can f identify, and our clients usually are more perspective and kind of um, progressive clients. They're able to identify the allies within their organization that make it easier for them to do that, to take that kind of suspension of disbelief from an organizational point of view and put themselves in and say, okay, okay, let's just, let's just play nice. They can find the allies within the organization. So I think that there's value in having someone external do it. And that's, I think, part of the reason why I've been really, really successful. But I have to be honest, from my point of view, I mean, I, I feel very strongly about the methodology, and I try to make it a part of wherever we work, you know, so that they can do it themselves without needing to have external people. And they've actually been very good about kind of bringing the process internally. So does that answer your question? And I'm sorry, did I cover what you? Okay. Any other questions? Yes? Yes, the, the, they definitely do. As a matter of fact, we're <coughs> successful if they do evolve. Um, the key thing, though, is that when they evolve, like like in a yearly basis, we strongly recommend they go through a similar exercise where they just kind of almost like let's do it all over again and see see what they're like, um, and and tweak that and kind of narrow the bandwidth for certain things. Um, maybe they will have learned. You know, certain aspects of their customer base is more important than others, and, and they'll use that. Um, but from start to finish, usually it's it's probably anywhere from very very you know abbreviated six weeks to much longer for some of the larger projects, been like twelve to fourteen weeks. It depends on the amount of input that we're allowed to get. And it also depends on the scope of the questions. The thing that's really amazing about this particular uh, approach to developing personas and actually starting any kind of strategic question, whether it's marketing, branding, sometimes even business, is that it's scalable. So if we got to answer a question like, OK, we have an opportunity to partner with this company, and that might change our brand. So if we're Starbucks, and you know FedEx wants to do something with us, OK? You can hold a workshop and you can develop certain ideas, you know, in a week to answer the question without developing personas. Okay, once the organization has instituted this idea of empathy, uh, so it's very scalable and it goes from everything at the level of what 
what the business value proposition is about to what the brand is about to a campaign. We've done this for campaign kind of concepts for did it for craft for a year for their annual campaign one year. Um, down to the level of specific like targeted campaigns, down to the level of websites and you know even apps. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for waving this stone. Thanks for coming, everyone. And um, if you want to come up and if you want to talk to Esteban a little bit on a personal note, I think he'll stick around for a little while. Okay. Oh, we have more? Yes, will you make your presentation available? Um, yes, I can post it or forward it to you, or okay. we can talk about how to do that. Okay. Great. Thank you.